Years ago when we lived in Talladega, we had a young man who was a member of the church there. His name was Jeff. Now you have to understand, Jeff was a student at the Helen Keller School, which meant Jeff had multiple and significant physical, emotional, and learning challenges. What Jeff didn't have was a lack of self-confidence. Jeff was known on Friday nights during football season to call into the local radio station. They had one of those um, post-game call-in scoreboard shows, and Jeff would call every Friday night. If it was a home game, he would call to report the score of the Talladega High School football game, and if it was an away game, he would call to ask if anybody knew the score of the Talladega High School football game, and it didn't matter if somebody had just called in with the same thing that Jeff was calling about, or even if Jeff had already called two or three times on the same night. Jeff also loved serving at church. He was a greeter on our First Impressions team. He was also an usher. And once a month, we would let him pray the benediction, sometimes on Sunday mornings, usually on Sunday nights. Jeff wanted to sing a solo. Jeff couldn't sing. Jeff wanted to preach. In fact, one Sunday after the service, we were all standing around talking, and in those days I didn't sit on this pew, I sat on that pew, so we're standing over here, and I look up, and Jeff is standing behind the pulpit, as if he is preaching. I love Jeff. Most everybody loved Jeff. But one thing we discovered about Jeff was you had to put limits on him. I remember having to explain one day how, why he was not able to greet the people at the front door, hand out the bulletins for the worship service, take up the offering during the service, pray for the offering, and then pray the benediction all on the same day. Literally, that happened not once, not twice, but multiple times. And I would have to say, Jeff, there has to be something for someone else to do. You see, every time you gave Jeff one thing to do, he wanted more. As one staff member observed, Jeff's ruler doesn't have any inches. You've probably known people like that before in your life. People whose rulers don't have inches. And maybe not in a good way like Jeff's ruler not having inches, but people who are always looking to get away with whatever they can get away with. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Their rulers have no inches. Well, the truth of the matter is that all of us have rulers without inches. It's part of our fallen nature. Give us an inch, we'll take a mile. And you might say that it was that reason for which Jesus began teaching the lessons in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 48, because when it comes to fulfilling the demands of the law, our rulers have no inches. Give us an inch, and we'll take a mile. Now, I want to remind you back a couple of weeks ago when we looked at this, first started looking at this part of Matthew chapter 5. In verse 20, Jesus made a statement that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the baseline. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's verse 20. Go then to verse 48, which is at the end of the chapter. And Jesus says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, now within those two verses, that, they kind of set the framework, the opening and the closing for what Jesus began to teach about fulfilling the law and the prophets in verse 21 all the way through the end of the chapter. Between those two statements, there are six examples that reveal to us the ways in which the religious leaders of Jesus' day had perverted the clear teachings of Scripture. 
give them an inch and they took a mile. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at two of those illustrations, the sins of murder and adultery. Both of those are clearly stated in the Ten Commandments. There's, no, there's, there's not any gray area with that. Thou shalt not commit murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus said it's not enough to avoid the act of murder and the act of adultery. Now to kind of keep that same analogy of rulers not having any inches, you can think of murder and adultery as being the entire ruler. And Jesus said, it's not enough to pay attention to the ruler, you've got to pay attention to the inches as well. Because the sins of murder and adultery, as with all other sins, the act of sin begins in the heart and in the mind. The sinful act of murder begins with the sinful emotion of anger. And the sinful act of adultery begins with the sinful thought of lust. Jesus said, pay attention to the inches. It's the details that matter. And so this morning, we want to turn our attention to the next four examples that reveal to us the ways in which those religious leaders of Jesus' day perverted the clear teachings of Scripture. And where the first two dealt with negative commands, do not murder, do not commit adultery, these four deal with things that the law allowed. Now, it's easier for us to pay attention to the details when it's something that's very specific. Don't do this. But when the law is telling us you can do this, that's where we have run into trouble because the law gives us an inch and we want to run over and take more than that. And so that's what Jesus is going to do here. He's giving us four more examples. These are provisions that God made because of our sinfulness. God said, there's no way they're going to be able to do this. And so here are provisions that I'm giving them. And as we look at these four, these four illustrations, they also reveal to us the four marks of a kingdom citizen. So first, a kingdom citizen is committed to his or her family. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because Jesus deals with divorce later on in Matthew's gospel. But I want us to look at it in light of the overall teaching of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, Jesus said, It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. It was also said. Now, that is referring to a rabbinic teaching, the teaching of the scribes, that was based on a faulty uh, interpretation of Deuteronomy chapter 24. Now, we're going to look at one verse later on in Deuteronomy 24, but that whole chapter is where God is saying, okay, divorce is outside of my plan, but there are going to be times where it happens. And so when it happens, here are the stipulations and here are the ways that I want it to take place. It is a provision that God was giving to the people of Israel because of their propensity to sin. And it was intended to show what we might call the cascading uh, potential for evil that divorce brings on. In other words, it's one of those things that, that once that one act happens, then there are multiple other things that happen as a result of that, and it just creates this, this sinful condition that goes well beyond what God had intended. And the reason that it does that is because divorce is tearing apart what God has joined together. So God has done a holy work, and then because of our sinfulness, we are tearing that apart. But the first verse in Deuteronomy chapter 24 reads like this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of, a, of divorce. Now, the meaning of that phrase when she ceases to find favor in him because he has found some indecency in her, it's not because she burned the biscuits. Now that's the way they had begun to interpret it, 
in Jesus' day but by the scribes, but that is not what the intent was. The intent was that she had done something to offend his honor. She had gone out on him. She had been with another person. And that was the intent behind that. But the scribes interpreted it to mean that men could divorce their wives for any or no reason at all. Give them an inch, take a mile. So Jesus comes and he sets the record straight. Look at verse 32. He says, But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. So what he's saying is that divorce without appropriate cause inevitably leads to adultery. Now, again, just remember, this is a provision that God made for man's sinful inability to be perfect as your Father in heaven is also perfect. God gave an itch. They took a mile. One of the great tragedies of our day, and it's part of the problem for what we see taking place all around us, is the ease with which we are willing to give up on the family. The ease with which we are willing to give up on one husband, one wife, resulting in children who are nurtured and loved and shepherded toward God's heart within the confines of that family. In fact, there are forces within our society which claim that family is actually the problem. That, that the nuclear family that we understand, husband, wife, children, that that, that is a patriarchal system that is designed to... to Uh, have control over other people, and therefore the family needs to be done away with completely. I could name organizations this morning and you would go, really? I had no idea that's what they believed. But it's true. There are forces within our society that want to tear down the family. And let's be honest, there are enough dysfunctional families that you could probably make that case. But that's not the way God designed it. God looked at man and he decided it's not good for him to be alone. And so God created a partner. And God joined the two, knitting them together so that the two would become one flesh. And he told them, be fruitful and multiply. The family. Psalm 128 speaks of the blessing of that family. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children peace. Be upon Israel. John Brood commented, This psalm, which is a blessing on the family, is also a blessing on the nation. Because as the family goes, so goes the nation. Because the blessing of a nation starts with the godliness in the hearts of parents. Such parents fear God and obey His commandments. Their strength flows to the children through the contentment and peace it produces in the family. And from solid families, strength flows to the nation. Oh, that we would have men and women in our day within the church who are committed to the family. A kingdom citizen is committed to the family. A kingdom citizen is also a man of his word. This is another instance where the people of Jesus' day took the clear teaching of Scripture and they convoluted it to fit, uh, basically giving them permission to do whatever it is that they wanted to do. Verse 33, Jesus said again, You have heard that it, it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. 
Now again, that, that's, a, that's a true statement. It goes back to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12, which states, You shall not swear falsely by my name. We think of swearing as different. We think of swearing as using words that we shouldn't use. But to swear an oath is something that is significant because to swear an oath means that whatever it is that you're swearing that oath by, you are calling that person or that object to be a witness to whatever it is that you are about to say. For instance, you go into a court of law, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. And in that moment, what you're doing is you're saying, not only am I speaking to the jury over here, to, to the judge and all of those who are here, but I'm calling on God himself to bear witness to the truth of what I'm about to say. If you do that, you better tell the truth. Because if you don't, what you're doing is you're saying, God, I want you to bear witness. I'm, bringing, I'm dragging you into this mess. And, and if I do that and I don't tell the truth, then I'm giving God permission to get vengeance for his honor. Again, our rulers have no inches. Because by Jesus' day... They took this to mean that as long as you swore by something other than God's name, you were okay. Remember, Leviticus says, you shall not swear falsely by my name. And so they would play this game of how far can you go? We won't, we won't swear by God's name, but we'll swear by the temple. We'll swear by Jerusalem. We'll swear by this or we'll swear by that. And so Jesus calls us back to the truth. Verse 34, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Ladies, you would disagree with that because you have people. But what Jesus is saying is, there is absolutely nothing that you can substitute for so help me God that doesn't drag God into the picture. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. Therefore, there is nothing. You can't swear by that fake plant right there because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Anything you do, you are dragging God into your story. I had a friend one time who was fond of saying, that's your lie, you tell it however you want to. You can't do that if you're calling on the Lord Himself to bear witness. Jesus says, let, your, let what you say be simply yes or no. He says, anything more than this comes from evil. Now, now just, just so we understand... This is not a prohibition of us going into a court of law where we're required to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. It's not saying don't do that. It's just saying be, be mindful that when you do that, you better tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Speak the truth, whether it is an official statement on the record or in your daily conversation. Recognize that there are no degrees of truth. A half-truth is a whole lie. Speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's what kingdom citizens do. We're people of our word. We stand up for the family. And we give up our rights for others. Amen? Or should it maybe be an oh my? Because one thing we as Americans are not very fond of is giving up our rights. Even the Declaration of Independence guarantees that all men are created equal and that all men have certain inalienable rights including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. One writer put it like this, he said, We idolize the hero who stands up for what is his no matter who it may offend. 
He's standing his ground. He's getting what's his. But that self-interested, self-protecting spirit is a characterization of our fallen humanity. Because above all else, one thing that we want is whatever we believe to be rightfully ours. And we will wreak whatever trouble we can to protect what is ours. Every society has rules. Every society has laws. And those rules and those laws are designed to maintain order. And those rules require that there be punishment when the rule is broken. Right? You know, if, if I speed going home, I know that I'm taking a risk of getting a ticket. Uh, that's, a, that's a cause and effect kind of thing. There's a rule, and if you break that rule, there are results of that. The idea behind that is to discourage people from doing what they shouldn't be doing. Civilized societies enact what is called the lex talionis, which simply means the punishment should fit the crime. So if I speed going home, I get a ticket, I don't get put in jail, right? The, the punishment should fit the crime. The law in Jesus' in the Old Testament operated off of lex talionis, the, the, the just punishment for the crime. So in verse 38, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What, what, what was the point behind that? Well, the idea was, it's lex talionis. If, 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 if an eye for an eye, if, if you do this, this is what happens. And what happens is equivalent to what you did. It's... it's it's there to discourage you from being a repeat offender, but it's also there to make sure that you don't get thrown into jail for going five miles an hour over the speed limit. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Not an eye for a head or a head for an eye or a leg for a foot. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's a limit on punishment. But by Jesus' day, the scribes had interpreted this to mean just the opposite of that. Rather than seeing an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth as a limit on punishment, they used it as a mandate for vengeance. You poke my eye out, I'm going to poke your eye out. You punch me in the arm, I'm going to punch you in the arm. You take my cow, I'm going to take your cow. It was, it was a, a license for vengeance. Again, God gave it to them as a limit on punishment. Give us an inch and we're always going to take a mile, right? We're always going to take whatever God gives us to try, to try to allow us to live gracefully in a fallen world. We're always going to take that and we're going to run with it just as far as we can for our own good. But Jesus took the opposite approach. He said, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Don't get retaliation. Now it's important to point out that he's speaking only about personal retaliation. He's not advocating lawlessness. He's not saying, let all the speeders go free. He's not saying, let all the murderers go free. He's saying, personally, in your own interaction with people, do not resist the one who is evil. He's advocating that we be willing to voluntarily give up our rights for the good of others. Verse 39, he says, If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, I'm going to take these one at a time because I think it's interesting the way Jesus breaks this down. What he's going to give us here are four instances, four rights that we might be willing to defend that Jesus says don't. And the first of these is your dignity. That's what he's talking about here. When he says, um, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, I want you to think about this. How do you slap someone on the right cheek? Well, there are two ways you can do it. You can come up behind them and slap them on the right cheek, in which case they're probably going to turn around and lay you out. 
Because not only did you slap them, you scared them. But to slap someone on the right cheek when you are facing them, it's the back of the hand. It's the only way you can do it unless you're left-handed. And they looked at left-handed people as evil, so he's not talking about left-handed people. I'm kidding about that, left-handers. It's with the back of the hand. And so it's not, it's not a violent attack that Jesus is talking about here. That would be a slap on the left cheek, and that would be assault, and then you go to jail. Jesus is talking here about someone who comes and slaps you on the right cheek. They're using the back of their hand. It is an offense to your dignity. They are questioning your honor. And Jesus says, not only let them do that, but turn and let them come back the other way as well. Be willing, be willing to give up your dignity. The second thing he says... If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now, the tunic is your undershirt. It's one thing for us to be willing to give up our undershirt for someone, but to give up our outer coat, and it's not a coat like this, it's more a coat like maybe you wore into the building this morning because it was 32 degrees outside. And in their day... That, that coat, that tunic on the outside was their security. So we would all think, well, I, I should be able to protect my right to security, right? Jesus says, no, if they, if they take your shirt, give them your coat. Why did the coat represent security? Because even the law said that if you take someone's coat, by the end of the day, you have to give it back to them. Because the coat was used not only for wearing as an outer garment, but it was a blanket, And most of these people didn't live in houses that had heat. None of these people lived in houses that had heat. Unless they built a fire. And many lived outside of a house. So the coat was necessary. He says, be willing to give up your security. Then he goes on to say, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Be willing to give up your liberty. You say, well, how does that represent liberty? Well, remember... This is a reference to the reality that the Roman occupying soldiers could come up to any citizen and say, I want you to carry my military backpack for a mile. And you would have to stop whatever you were doing. It didn't matter what it was. It could be important, it could be insignificant, but you had to stop what you were doing, to give up your liberty, and basically be a slave to that soldier for one mile. Jesus said... Go on and take it another. Don't fight back against that. Be willing to give it up. Then he says in verse 42, Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. It's property. That's property. I'll say that most commentators agree that this applies only to legitimate requests based on legitimate needs and does not apply to every foolish and or selfish request. But basically what Jesus is saying is, if your neighbor needs something, let him have it. Let him borrow it, whether or not you ever get it back. We had a situation like that here at the church, I don't know, six months ago, maybe longer. A fellow came by, he was a laborer, He needed a ladder that met OSHA standards and he didn't have one and he couldn't go back to work until he had one. And so we let him borrow a ladder from the church. We've not seen that ladder. And that's okay. Your neighbor needs it and you've got it. Let him have it. Not a foolish request. I need a ladder to go to work. He wasn't asking for $100 to go buy a ladder. Because we all know that wasn't going to buy a ladder. That's a foolish request. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying be willing to part with what you have for the good of others. A kingdom citizen is not, is not trying to hold on to his rights. A kingdom citizen will release his rights for the good of others. Whether that is the right... Um, to liberty or the right to property or the right to security or even defending your own honor. 
be willing to give it up for the good of others. Finally, a kingdom citizen lives out the great commandment. This is the last of the six illustrations that Jesus used to differentiate between the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees and the command to be perfect as God is perfect. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, where does it say that in the Bible? That's the only place it says it. In fact... Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 says just the opposite. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. I think it's significant that they left off the love your neighbor as yourself part, and they inserted in its place, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That, that's pretty revealing of just how wicked our hearts can be. We all recognize that love your neighbor is a basic tenet of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the first is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. That is foundational to what it means to be a believer. So where does the hate your enemy part come in? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many of you have enemies and how many of you, at least at one point in your life, have had hatred in your heart for your enemy. And I'm certainly not going to have an altar call for that because every single one of us would either be at the altar for that or we should be at the altar for lying about it. It's the natural inclination of our hearts, right? Just like if somebody slaps you, the natural inclination of your heart is, I'm going to slap you back probably before I think about it. That's how wicked our hearts are. So why did the rabbis teach? Because when he said, you've heard it said, love your enemies or love your neighbor and hate your enemies. That's because the rabbis were teaching that. It's okay. Now think about this. What group of people did the Jews hate? Samaritans? Romans, basically anybody that wasn't a Jew. Gentiles. And they had a whole system of rules and laws of uh, how you treat a Gentile. So they were basically teaching, love your neighbors, which are Jews, hate your enemies, which is anybody who's not a Jew. So Jesus comes along, he says, hold on, wait a minute. You kind of got some things out of order here. Verse 44, he says, but I say, do you love your enemies? And pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good, and He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And then He says, for if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? That's no big deal. There are some people that are easy to love. He says, don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers other Jews, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do that? So here's the sermon within the sermon. Remember, all of this is flowing, coming out of the Beatitudes. In the last two of the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are those when you are persecuted. Blessed are those when you are walking in a way that is a godly way, and because you're walking in a godly way, you are persecuted because you're going in a way that is different than the rest of the world. When we live the kingdom life, we will be persecuted for His name's sake. When you live your life to please God, you will have enemies. Jesus says, do not hate them. Instead... Pray for them. That's what Jesus did. Remember his words on the cross? It was a prayer. Father, forgive them. They ain't got a clue what they're doing. So Jesus is not telling us to do something that he was not willing to do himself. 
And I doubt any of us have any enemies to the extent that he did. Do not hate them. Pray for them. Demonstrate your sonship by going above and beyond. Show that you are different than someone who is not a follower of Jesus. That's the whole point of those verses. And when we display these marks of a kingdom citizen, we let our light shine before men. We stand out from the crowd. And God gets the glory. You see how all of chapter 5 fits together. So I've said from the very beginning, I, I look at chapter 5 as a series of different messages that were all part of one series that Jesus delivered because one builds off of the other and they all flow together and everything ties back to when we are living the kingdom kind of life, all of these things are going to happen. Jesus says we should act in a certain sort of way so that we will be that city set on a hill, so that we will be that light that is shining, that others would see our good works, how we stand out from the crowd, and God would get all of the glory. When we sang that earlier, we are your church. We called on God to build His kingdom now. How does He do that? When we do that. When we live as kingdom citizens. So I'm going to ask you to join me in praying right now that God would allow us in the course of this next week to stand out from the crowd that others would see Jesus. Father, I pray right now for everyone in this room, everyone who is joining us online, for everyone who will join us online in the course of the next days, weeks, perhaps even months. God, would you set our hearts on fire for your kingdom? God, would we be a generation of reconciliation? Would we go into the hard places of life as ministers of your love and your grace? Father, help us to stand out from the crowd as kingdom citizens. As we pray in Christ's name.